Welcome to another edition of RCE. Uh, it's been a little while, but uh, we're back for the we're new back. year. Yes, we're back. And um, again, you can always find old shows and nominate new ones and see what we've got listed at rce-cast.com. Uh, you can also follow me personally on Twitter, uh, Brock Palin, all one word. And you can also find links to that on the website. You can also find a link to Jeff's blog uh, off of the RCE website. So that is Jeff on the other end there. Jeff has been my co-host now for quite some time and has been a great yeah. help for this. So, yep. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Welcome to 2012. We're, uh, you know... Comfortably in the second month, we were taking our, you know, January siesta. That's what I'm. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, recovering from all the holidays, post SC, all that stuff. It's a, uh, it's a little bit, a little bit caught up now. So we can get back yeah. into this. Now back into the RCE. So let me uh, let me give a quick intro here to our, our guest today. Today we're talking to Shai full time. He's the founder and CEO of Scale MP. So Shai, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm Shai. I'm founder and CEO of ScaleMP. i doing that for the last nine years. Prior to that, I spent a couple of years at the VC industry. And prior to that, I um, ran a IT operations and advanced technology research center for Israeli Defense Force Intelligence. All right. Well, I understand that you've just come off about a 17-hour flight, so I think uh, it's perfect time for an interview right now. So we'll get you at your absolute best, right? The absolute best, best with a little bit less oxygen in my brain. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we roll right into this? Uh, specifically, we're interested in your uh, the product that you guys offer, a uh, Scale MP. I've actually personally used this a little bit, Jeff. I don't know if you have. Um, but it's it's an interesting thing. I get a lot of questions about it. So why don't you give us an overview? What is Scale MP? So in fact, Scale MP is the name of a company. Our product is VSMP Foundation. VSMP Foundation is a virtualization software that virtualizes multiple systems into one virtual machine, providing uh, you with the uh, access to all the resources within a single context. Not to confuse that with the virtualization uh, such as um, offered by VMware and uh, KVM and others, which take single system and slice it to multiple VMs, our VMs provide you the aggregate resource of multiple independent uh, servers. So I, I kind of sometimes refer to this as like inverse virtualization. How, how does this compare to other things like, you know, skilled BPROC or something like MOSIX? Excellent, excellent question. In fact, these are attempts to go and address the fact that the collection of servers are hard to manage and require special programming model. Um, our approach to that is to hide the fact that the, um, your infrastructure has multiple servers. So we virtualize them as a single one. And now that you have a single operator, a single virtual machine running across all of them, you can run, run a single copy of the operating system of the CD, Red Hat, and you can run your process there, and you can go to your process and allocate four terabytes of memory if that's the aggregate RAM that you have in the underlying systems. If you use MOSIX or Skilled or BPROC or you name it, you are basically getting a single address space, namespace for processes or for files, but you're not getting a single copy of the operating system. And that's what you get when you have a single VM running across multiple systems. I right, know what's the difference between doing this and say buying, you know, a, a big iron machine. You know, many core machines are getting uh, more popular these days. I, I think a lot of vendors offer sixty-four cores these days, and you can even get quite a bit of RAM. What's the, the difference here? What's the value proposition? I, I think that they are free. First is the price. Um, large machines are priced uh, what I'm calling in a reverse dog dog food formula. When you go and buy your dog food, if you buy one pound of dog food, you'll pay X. If you buy five pounds of dog food, you'll pay less than 5X. But when you buy big machines, you'll find out that a dual socket server costs you 5K. Four socket servers, uh, twice the resources, will cost you 25K. And eight socket servers will cost you about 100K. So you double the compute and memory, but you quadruple the cost. With our technology, you just use off-the-shelf building block and build the system you want for your workload. So that's one price. Second is performance. You're not limited to the type of processor sitting in this high-end machine. So, for example, 
if you go to buy four socket or eight socket machine today, it would be based on um, on the Intel side on Westmere processor, Westmere EX. If you do that with ScaleMP technology these days, you get a Sandy Bridge based platform. So you get the latest and greatest um, CPUs. Not only that, even if you go for Westmere on dual socket machines, you can get Westmere machines, that Westmere processors that goes all the way to 3.46 gigahertz. So you get really, really advantage um, in speed compared to what you get in four socket and eight socket machines. Last but not the least is flexibility. Let's assume that you already have your cluster. You're running your 200, 400, 600, maybe 1,000 node cluster, and you just need a large memory resource for a temporal use. Now you can take a software, allocate 20 machine, create a VM on an on-demand basis, run your workload, and when you are done, kill it and get the nodes back to the pool. So obviously, if you're tying all these things together, you need rel- a lot of communication between the systems so that they're kind of hidden. Uh, what kind of hardware requirements are required for this? Any x86 server um, is what you need. The systems have to be connected with InfiniBand. There is a detailed list of systems that we have certified on our website. Um, you can see there are dozens of servers from Dell, HP, IBM, Supermicro, uh, Intel, um, others, Fujitsu um, uh, on the website. In fact, in, if you have a server that, that's not on our website, there is a place to um, post server information and get from us, um, um, get us into a situation that we certify that machine. So, um, all in all, if you have a dual, if you have a x86 system, whether that's a dual socket, quad socket, or eight socket machine, and it's connected with InfiniBand, that's you have the basics, and you can go from there. So, do I have to patch Linux or anything like that to get a special kernel to put like a hypervisor layer in there? Like, what's actually involved for booting this thing up? So, it depends what you're trying to do. Um, you can take um, a, any operating system and run it on an aggregate VM um, as long as you're using the I.O. and the memory only of the all the nodes you have. If you're trying to boot the off-the-shelf operating system, um, take, for example, Suze or Red Hat on a machine that has 1,000 cores, you better customize your kernel a bit. Um, not a lot of customization, a bit of them, and we provide them. You can download that off our website. So if you set up the VM to just aggregate memory of the all the nodes you have, use the CPUs of one machine, no problem. Take it. Don't need to customize anything. Operating system can go as is. But if you try to run a high core count VM, think about the um, hundreds of cores. Best for you is to go and customize the kernel, and we can provide you that. Of course, the more advanced kernel that you use, if you start moving into the uh, 3.2 and others, uh, you need to do less customization because the kernel itself is becoming smarter. That's great. So I'm going to jump back a little bit. A minute ago, you said that uh, you have to use InfiniBand. Uh, Let me ask you, why InfiniBand? And I'm asking from a little bit of a bias. I work for a company, right, that we we used to do InfiniBand, and we decided to not do InfiniBand for a variety of reasons that are are not too interesting. So why did you guys choose to use InfiniBand? So history of ScanMP, our first product, was running on Ethernet, in fact. There's nothing specific in InfiniBand that uh, is a must for our product to work. Um, years ago, we figured out that InfiniBand is the interconnect that gives us the highest bandwidth. And since um, our product is um, translating, basically using algorithms, latency into bandwidth equation, okay, so we take latency-sensitive operations and we translate them um, to be less sensitive using a high degree of bandwidth doing prefetch, prefetch and cache of memory. Between boards, we needed an interconnect that will give us the highest degree of bandwidth. And today, the interconnect that gives you that is the InfiniBand. You know, InfiniBand on a centibridge machine uh, is uh, um, crossing the 50 gigabit per second. So that's that's really great. Now, is there any? Would there be any benefit in doing some kind of dedicated networking yourself, like uh, you know, a hypertransport type like solution or? or something that would extend QPI or the PCI bus or something like that as opposed to, say, a commodity network solution? Um, there are discussions with some partners in the market on using PCI Express 
um, as a native interconnect, there are discussions with others on 10 gig Ethernet, uh, 10 gig Ethernet as an interconnect. It's all possible. There's Again, there's nothing uh, unique but InfiniBand compared to other interconnect uh, that is a must to use. And I do believe that um, if you look um, 12 to 18 months in the future, you will see customers, not in a lab, but real customers, running VSMP Foundation across multiple systems that are connected with interconnect that is not InfiniBand. So let, let's talk about actually taking some of those big nodes that you say were expensive and using ScaleMP on those. Yeah, it became popular recently. So, so far we spoke quite a bit about technology, right? But customers use VSMP to do one of three things. Customers using that to simplify small clusters. So if you have a distributed software, commercial software, um, that need to run on a small cluster, eight socket, eight node cluster, or sixteen node cluster, without virtualization, you take the cluster away. You eliminate that. Now you have a, like a super workstation that um, that you need to manage. Typical customers in that domain use blades, dual socket blades. Second segment of customers will be customers that need the highest end machines. And you're looking at customers that look into have VMs with 500, 500 cores, 1,000 cores, customers that are looking to have machines with 5 terabytes and 10 terabytes of memory. It's very typical that customers in that domain will use four socket nodes as the building block. And because their target is that if, if you're trying to get to 10 terabytes of memory, it's what's more, there's nothing easier than taking 10 or a one terabyte systems or 20 half a terabyte systems and use that as a building block. Okay, It's still cheaper than any other um, a other technology. And in fact, in these four socket uh, building blocks, you have enough PCI slots to connect the machines with multiple independent InfiniBand lanes. And that improves the performance. So we see quite a bit of those in that segment. Last but not the least, uh, we target the uh, customers that have very large clusters, clusters that have hundreds of nodes, and we allow an on-demand creation of SMP coming from rocks or HPCMU, or IBM XCAT, Bright Cluster Manager, and any kind of provisioning system can go to the and provision VSMP on demand on existing cluster. And typically in that environment, you'll see customers using high density dual socket systems. Now, you said a couple, an interesting thing a couple times here that I want to I get a little more detail on. You said that uh, you can use uh, this product to aggregate your memory across multiple nodes. Now, when you do that, is the memory of the remote nodes essentially acting like swap for the master node? Is that what your algorithms do? Uh, you can think about it that way. Um, when you cache and prefetch data, there are three things you always need to think about. First, prefetch. You need to predict what's going to happen, happen next and bring it in ahead of time. That will save time with the next cache miss. So that's prefetch. Then when you prefetch, that means that you have a copy of the data on your node that may reside somewhere else. That's called cache, right? You cache data. So you prefetch the data ahead of it's needed, and then you cache. You hold a copy of data on your node. And last but not the least, you need to evict data. You need to evacuate data. And to evacuate data, it's also a, a pretty compli complicated task because what data you need to call it a kick out of the node, what you're calling swapping, right? Kick out of the node in order to free space for the next piece of data that you want to cache or prefetch. So most of our, uh, so the, 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 the algorithms of in VSMP Foundation are in that area. What should they prefetch, i.e., what memory will be needed next that is not needed now? Next is how do I hold a copy of that and make sure that the copy is coherent? And last but not the least, when I have a memory pressure, what is the right memory that I need to kick out of my node and call it swap it, I'll use your term, um, move it to, to the other node so my operating system and the application that runs will have the most, uh, call it, um, um, uh, easy um, and performing experience when it's running on my node. So what you're describing here is really just a lot of stuff that NUMA stuff, I, like um, some of the large iron machines out there where they've got cabling between IRUs and they bolt them all together, they have little caches on there where they can look up where certain things in memory are and invalidate them in cache lines and everything else like that. Uh, 
is this some of the stuff that you guys are doing also? Yes and no. So when you ever do, of course, we expose NUMA, NUMA topology and NUMA hierarchy to the operating system and everyone that used the, um, that know how to look into NUMA topology in the operating system, whether that's uh, using a, a, um, operating system APIs or stuff like HW or others, you can see the entire system architecture and that's great. Um, but there is one critical difference, and the critical difference is that in all these big iron NUMA systems, the NUMA topology is fixed. So assume yourself that you build a function that describes the distance between a fixed CPU and a fixed memory location. For every memory location in the system, you will have a fixed distance. We can agree on that, right? In VSMP, the distance between CPU and a memory is not fixed. It changes over time. We move data, we migrate data, we change its locality. So while we expose new architecture to the operating system, underneath what happens is that memory that you want, may, for, may think that is far will become close, and the other way around. Now, VSMP is smart enough to do that in a way that is beneficial for your application. Okay, and that that does smack uh, very similarly of of caching and whatnot too. That even even in regular NUMA, things that are far will temporarily become close, and 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 vice versa. But you did mention one thing in there that uh, is near and dear to my heart, which is HW loc. So does HW loc accurately report all the aggregate memory and CPUs of a uh, of one of these machines? Yes. And um, I recall that uh, we ran HW Loc on a system that has 768 cores and 6 terabytes of memory. And we got a huge um, a <laughs> output from HW Loc that described the hierarchy to the finest detail. Excellent. Uh, uh, and and that's, that's very, very nice. Very good job, guys. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> so in all of this, I, I've noticed... Uh, well, I have a- but I want to I want to go back to the question you asked earlier about the caches. You need to remember the difference in size of caches. When you look on a big iron machine, the size of a cache on a CPU or even a cache on a board is measured in megabytes, dual digits megabytes. The size of cache in VSMP is measured in gigabytes. Hmm, so it's okay. a thousand times bigger. And that's what buys you the performance. Okay, so so a very coarse grain, uh, you know, skipping a lot of details and benefits would be uh, a description of this would be you know a gigabyte size cache. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And and a, and a set of algorithms that you can run on a CPU. Don't forget, it's a virtual machine that runs on the CPU. So you have all the ability to run very sophisticated algorithms that are very hard to do in silicon in dedicated silicon. If you look on a cache controller on one of the big a machine, they'll just handle LRU. That's what they do. And they handle LRU very, very fast. But it's LRU. And LRU is not good enough for complicated workload. Think about the typical case is always to think about a workload that scan a large amount of memory and have a small piece, call it a, like a output buffer, where you save the temporal data. If you run something like that through LRU, the temporal data will always kick out of the cache once in a while. In VSMP, that is being identified and that is being locked to the board and only the big data is getting in and out of, of the board. So data to set detection and other algorithms that help you maintain the cache um, at the best accuracy is uh, critical, definitely, when you hand, uh, handle a cache that is that size. Okay, well, it strikes me that uh, a critical difference here, though, is that cache is outside of main memory, and so it doesn't count against your usable memory, for example. It sounds like what you're describing is is sort of analogous, to, well, not entirely, but kind of analogous to, to RAID, uh, RAID 5 or RAID 6 or something like that, where you're actually using some of the usable memory to temporarily you know, make copies of, of other memory, so to speak. And so therefore, your total usable memory of the aggregate is going to be less than the sum. Is, is that correct? That, that's that's exactly, exactly the case. VSMP costs you, quote-unquote, 10% of the memory, where 10%, 10% okay. of the memory is split as follows. 30% of that is the software itself. 
you know, you have a piece of software, it needs to run somewhere, it's maintained some tables, uh, arrays, and data structures, and that costs you about 3% of the total memory, which is 30% of the 10 I mentioned earlier. 7% is used as the basic cache, the distributed cache across the system, and now 7% is a very high number. So it's a small number of your memory, but a very high number in gigabytes. Think about the following. If you take uh, 32 machines, that each one of them has 64 gigabytes of memory, you have two terabytes. You have two terabytes RAM. Right. Two terabytes RAM, the 10% will be 200 gig, okay? And 70% out of the 200 gig will be 140 gig. 140 gig is huge cash for your workload, and that's what gives us this um, excellent performance across the InfiniBand link because the InfiniBand link all only be only used in order to prefetch data into the cache, uh, which is pre-populated based on the behavioral analysis of the application that happened in, re- in, in runtime in the background. So that cache is divided ac- across all the machines, though. Uh, the InfiniBand, as fast as it is, is still pretty slow compared to the inside of the box. What kind of considerations done for like process migration? If you're running a threaded application, they're all designed around the assumption of I have main memory kind of speeds. So, in, in fact, when you think about it, a single core today can access memory for memory-only operation at about nine gigabyte per second. That's what you can get when you run a, let's say, stream bandwidth on a stream benchmark. On a single core, you get nine gigabytes per second. Infiniment link today get you about three gigabytes per second. So it's not it's not like orders of magnitude slower. It's a couple of factors slower. The the nice thing that we do at ScaleMP, we predict what's going to miss next. And the a CPU, when it waits for memory, it's not waiting for memory bandwidth, it's made, waiting for memory and being stalled because of the latency of reading for memory. So with VSMP, what we do is we predict based on the way the application behaves, what's the next cache line that will be needed? And we will pre-fetch that over the infinite link to the system. So once you have a cache miss, we'll try to predict what will be the next 10 cache misses and bring that on, so next time that you need a memory, it's already on your local motherboard. Um, and therefore, while the bandwidth is important, what's more important is your ability to predict when next time you're going to hit a latency and use the high degree of bandwidth that you have on interconnect, such as InfiniBand, to bring it on um, to the board ahead of time. And so that's a major part of your value proposition. There is is the uh, you know the secret sauce of having better uh, cache guessing algorithms than what's in your Intel or AMD or whatever hardware, right? Correct. And and again, you need to you know with all due respect to to the amazing work done by Intel and AMD and others, there are things that cannot be done um, without understanding the application context and doing code scanning and stuff like that that typical cache controllers can do and hypervisors or virtual machine monitors can easily do, okay, because we always have control on the processor and we know what processor is running. So a a typical way to influence these kinds of things is like in the OpenMPI project, we actually put, you know, cache directives, cache compiler directives in our code itself, which give the compiler hints to help with the pipelining and the, the pre-caching and, and all the things you were talking about before. Do you have such APIs for your product as well for applications to use? Excellent question. So, yes, we do. We recommend using them if and only if you know what you're doing. Very similar to the example you gave before. If you will give a CPU cache hints to the processor without knowing what you're exactly doing, you lose performance. So there are directives to say, to tell the machine not to cache stuff or to, on the other end, to lock memory to a specific node. And there are customers that are using that. In fact, we provide some, uh, for example, our MPI library, optimized MPI library that we provide is making use of that. So the other interesting aspect is our, our real-time application profiler. 
since we have a virtual machine monitor that track the way application access memory, I.O., the way it's received interrupts across all devices, we have a way to pull it out of the virtual machine with 3% overhead and then visualize that. And that lets you take an application and go and look into why your application doesn't scale. And um, one of the difficulties today is that it's very hard to get a complete system view of the way your application performs on a typical system. Whether that's a dual socket or four socket or eight socket system, doesn't really matter. You can look on things the way they behave from a cache perspective with applications such as Vitune, but to try to look on the overall load of an application on the system bus or on the IO bus or how many interrupts my application is getting, very, very difficult. So we give customers the ability to run their application and look for a profiler, how many interrupts across all CPUs, which CPU waited for what CPU, what type of uh, um, uh, areas in the code in a specific procedure created the higher degree of load on the memory bus. And then that's give you lots of insight into the way you wrote your applications. And in some cases, if you're really writing applications, because most people you know, run applications that someone else wrote, but if you are um, writing your own application, it gives you the ability to go and optimize your application with the closed loop feedback from the machine itself. That's very interesting. So now you mentioned in there something else that's very near and dear to my heart is MPI. How are people with MPI applications using machines with your software? Um, so first, we have quite a bit of those. And first, why? The reason is to, for people that use MPI to use VSMP is that we eliminate all the operational aspect of running on a cluster. So you have a single operating system, you have single storage. Scratch storage is extremely fast because you can see all the I.O., all the drives of the different nodes in the operating system and uh, let's say do a RAID 0 to have a fast scratch. So from operational perspective, you get, a, think about it like a very large workstation. From application perspective, application seeing operating system and application seeing all the cores and using MPI, our uh, MPI, um, spec MPI performance is equal to a cluster of same size and same hardware. So you don't have any kind of a measurable difference in performance. Um, it's very, very close. Of course, it depends on application. I can show you cases that MPI application run on shared memory machine up to 15% faster than a cluster. I can show you some cases where application, uh, MPI application runs on shared memory machine a 5 to 10% slower compared to cluster because just the nature of the application. So in that case, VSMP perform as close as possible to a cluster. So from that perspective then, does the MPI just view this as one big shared memory machine and it uses yeah. its shared memory transport, not any network transport? Exactly. So uh, we recommend our customers to use MPitch. We have a, a highly tuned version of MPitch 2. If one wants to use that and it's using Nemesis and, you know, shared memory communication. So when, when I tested this, we actually booted off of uh, thumb drives. You gave us these, these mini thumb drives and we stuck it in the internal USB port on every node and it booted up and then it went through normal Pixie and it put our load on it and we modified our load to put your custom kernel. So that tells me this is all way below the operating system. Therefore, looks like you could support a lot of different operating systems. What, what do you support officially though? We officially support the Linux uh, operating systems, um, Red Dot, SUSE, CentOS, Scientific Linux, you name it. Anything that runs a recent enough version of uh, Linux, call it like a 2.6, uh, 11 kernel and on, that will be fine. Depends, of course, the size of the virtual machine. If you want to run a virtual machine with 1,000 cores, you better have a kernel that is like 2.6.30 plus. If you're just looking to run a virtual machine that uh, run across uh, four nodes of dual socket, you can use a pretty old kernel. Uh, the community is making great progress in supporting larger and larger uh, x86 shared memory systems. Um, typical question is why not Windows? And the answer for that is that uh, we haven't seen demand for a um, large scale uh, Windows uh, virtual machine and when such will come up, will be uh, more than happy to go and do that. In fact, 
I'll just uh, raise an interesting um, perspective here. You can take, uh, think about that, uh, 20 dual socket machines with, let's say, 64 gigabyte each one of them and create from that a virtual machine. So that will be virtual machine with 40 sockets multiplied by your six cores or eight cores, whatever you have. And uh, 64 gigabytes memory will give you 1.3 terabytes of memory. You run on that Red Hat. You open in Red Hat KVM. And in KVM, you run yourself, let's say, 200 VMs that running Windows. Working very, very nice, excellent performance. And that is a good way for you to have a single instance running many, many VMs rather than having 20 servers, each one of them running few VMs. And you need to do migration, a live manual migration between nodes and take care of the shared storage. So having one big virtual machine that then on top of that running a partitioning hypervisor such as AVM is um, one of the use cases to use VSMP Foundation and there are customers doing that. So let me go a, a slightly different way here. Um, let me ask you about how is locality managed? So when you're aggregating not just memory but memory and CPUs, how do you is, – is there a secret sauce in there that tries to keep everything local to itself? So can I have threads from one process migrate to a different server if their memory is over on a different server, for example? Um, let me try to answer that like that. So first, to the operating system, we expose NUMA machine. That's first. Then we track data um, locality whether the execution of the application is exploiting the data locality to its maximum effect. Now, that's not always possible for operating system and application because it may be that when you try to allocate memory, it must have allocated from a different uh, NUMA node. Just the life of it, that NUMA node was full. In that case, VSMP will move the NUMA node or the memory that you're using and make them local. Again, the NUMA... A topology is not fixed. It's always changes, so changing. So we will move memory that that's um, attached to CPU 1 and switch it with memory that attached to CPU 2 in order to make sure that CPU 1 has the greatest locality. Of course, if the thread is then moved by the operating system to another CPU, then the memory will follow the thread. Okay? That's uh, one additional reason why when you have a very, very large machine, you want to tune the scheduler a bit. Uh, there are scheduler uh, controls that you can uh, affect by syscontrol to make sure that the operating system moves your thread, threads um, when, uh, only when what's must and use uh, KMP affinity if you use OpenMP. Um, in order to make sure that you know what's the affinity of your application. But that's a, you know, that's a common technique for everyone that runs on a normal machine. Try to make sure that you know what's the execution affinity. The unique thing about VSMP is that if you keep execution affinity, we will optimize the data affinity to the CPUs rather than relying all the, on the operating system to allocate the memory close to the CPUs. You just make sure that the execution will be fixed, we will then move the data to be as close as possible to your threads. So call it lightweight NUMA in that way. You need to be less concerned about it. So what's coming in the future for Scale MP? What's What do you have on the roadmap? So support for a larger, larger VMs, we always see that. We are looking into having a support for GPUs somewhere um, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, we're speaking with different uh, processor vendors. You may see VSMP Foundation running on uh, processors that are not x86 somewhere in the future. And uh, of course, support for other interconnects, uh, not just uh, uh, not just InfiniBand. Um, the integration into more and more provisioning systems to allow more dynamic a virtual machine uh, with the control from job scheduler, which we see customers doing that today, uh, call it on a manual basis. I would like to believe, based on work that we are doing with some vendors, that you will see somewhere um, in the future the ability to get your job in the job scheduler. Job is analyzed by the job scheduler. Job scheduler calling the provisioning system and creating a VM on the fly at the size needed by the job 
that is in the job scheduler, which is then submitted to the virtual machine, running there and at the end being killed, and the, the nodes are being recycled for other purposes. There are customers that are doing that today using pre and post script that they they made to themselves, but as a baked product from a job scheduler and provisioning systems, um, I see a couple of initiatives these days, and I want to believe that uh, not in the uh, too dis- uh, distant uh, future, you will see that as a kind of um, a baseline offering from uh, companies in that domain. So what's the most unusual uses of your of you know VSMP that you've ever seen? You know things that you didn't really envision that people would would do with it. So um, I, one of them I mentioned earlier uh, is the use of VSMP to simplify uh, clusters that are running VMs. I mentioned that uh, earlier. The other one, and uh, you know it's unusual, but it's not being usual is analytics. Um, we see more and more customers use VSMP to create large memory systems for analytics and in-memory databases is another hot word these days, uh, big data problems. We never thought about ourselves as in a company that solved these type of problems, but uh, we're seeing now with the linear I.O. performance VSMP provides, if you take 10 systems and have a I.O. subsystem for each one of them, the aggregate storage performance you get is the provide you the performance of all of them. In fact, the VSMP is proven these days to provide uh, um, on eight dual socket systems uh, 20% better performance than the Fusion I.O. for 40% reduced price. So you see customers are building these, uh, um, call it a mid-size, um, you know, mid-size scale MP these days is like four terabyte uh, machine that has a um, some good, uh, you know, 30 to 40 sockets to run in-memory database with a very, very fast uh, I/O subsystem that is built by aggregating the drives on all the different nodes. We haven't intended uh, that was not our intention when we started the company, but people are doing that. Cool. So, what's uh, you, you've been throwing around some big numbers here? What's what's the biggest? VSMP installation you've seen, maybe in terms of RAM or number of processes or nodes or what have you? So, unfortunately, I, not all of them are public, okay? So, can, sure. The, but the What's largest the one you public, can cite then? <laughs> largest, the largest public one that is uh, running, and I think that they issued the PR, it's not a governmental agency, so they're allowed to, has a 7 terabytes and 768 cores. Um, um, there is that's in um, Cifronet in Poland um, at uh, San Diego supercomputing centers they have uh, 32 virtual machines each one with uh, 512 cores and a modest uh, memory about uh, 2 to 4 terabytes per VM um, we just recently not yet announced they won a significant virtualization project in a in the UK, where a customer will have VMs with a 512 to a thousand cores, and where the amount of memory uh, per VM uh, there is a four to eight terabyte. Uh, so that's also on the uh, large scale side. But the typical customers are uh, somewhere in the um, four, two to four terabyte size, and um, anywhere in the 200 to 400 cores. So that's kind of the the mid-sized customers. Well, thanks a lot for your time. This has been informative. Uh, where can we find more information about ScaleMP? www.scalemp.com um, You can find lots of information there. There is a form on the website that allows you to submit your information, email and, and the name uh, with specific areas uh, you like to get uh, more information um, on and we'll submit you that. Um, you know, we just celebrated um, two months ago customer number 300, and uh, we are growing pretty fast. So um, we are looking forward to have uh, more joining the next generation uh, virtualization for large scale machines. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Goodbye.